Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for our Grace Harbor Fisheries discussion um, as port, part of the North of Falcon process for 2022. I'm just gonna go ahead and give us maybe about two minutes here uh, until we sort of start leveling off with people joining us and then we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Okay, I think it looks like our participant list has started to level off. Um, so I'll just get started here again uh, uh, with just the general, um, this should all be familiar to everybody at this point, but the Zoom meet, call logistics and ground rules. Um, so you can turn your camera on and mute or unmute yourself through the control panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're gonna keep folks muted during the beginning of our program. And then we will unmute you and we open it up for questions and feedback. Callers can unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. Uh, we ask that you raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, you can access this through the control panel at the bottom of the screen. You can also raise your hand by hovering over your face uh, or name on the list of participants. Callers can raise their hand by dialing star nine. Um, so please be respectful of others. Uh, mute your phone uh, or line and be sure you're listening to others when they're speaking. Be tough on the issues and questions, but not on people or organizations. Uh, please no personal attacks, insults or threats. Um, speak and act professionally. And, and uh, uh, please also try to allow for a balance of speaking time. Um, if you have any technical issues during the call, you can use the chat button and we'll help you through those. Um, and don't use the comment section for questions um, because we're going to take those live. We, we should have plenty of time at the end um, to hear everybody who would like to say anything. Um, so with that, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Marlene Wagner. I'm the South Coast Policy Lead. Um, and we are here today uh, to, to have a Grays Harbor Fisheries discussion as part of the 2022 North of Falcon process. Um, all the meeting materials are on the website and these links are clickable. Um, and so you can follow through and look at those materials as we move along. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, start with some staff introductions. We'll briefly go through the North of Falcon process. Um, we'll review our 2022 Grace Harbor salmon forecasts. Um, we'll review our 2022 management objectives and fishery planning and our model fishery scenarios. And our primary purpose tonight is to hear your thoughts and your ideas about the fisheries this year. And we're gonna discuss points that may, we might wanna contemplate as we're crafting these potential seasons and we're thinking about different possible scenarios. So here's our staff organization chart for Grace Harbor. Most of these folks are here on the line with us tonight. Um, as, as the South Coast Policy Lead, I work on the statewide salmon management team under Mark Baltzell, our statewide salmon and steelhead manager, and Kyle Addix, our intergovernmental salmon manager. Um, over in the region, James Losey is our region six fish program manager. Rob Allen oversees the hatcheries. Mike Sharp is our district fish biologist. And Kim Figler-Barnes and Kurt Holt are the area biologists that work alongside Mike. So what is North of Falcon? North of Falcon is the annual cooperative process to set salmon seasons in Washington waters. This name refers to waters north of Oregon's Cape Falcon, which marks the southern border of Washington's management of stocks. Um, north of Falcon is just one component of a larger salmon setting process that it also involves the state, tribal governments, 
federal regular, regulators and other US states and Canada. And here is just a, a further brief overview of the North of Falcon process. And we start with forecasting the abundance of each stock. From there, we can determine if there is a harvestable surplus. Once we have determined if and what the harvestable surplus is, we can model fisheries to determine which stocks are gonna be constraining stocks. And we predict what we will catch under different fishing scenarios. And so this is the ongoing process that, that we are currently in. Um, and then we'll negotiate with our tribal co-managers and other states for the sharing of catching stocks. Um, so the next two slides are uh, another review. Um, this is just our schedule. Uh, here we are now at March 21st. Um, tomorrow night is the Pacific Fishery Ocean Management Public Hearing. Um, and again, tonight we're here to go over the forecasts and open a discussion about our fisheries in Grays Harbor. Uh, on the 30th, we'll have a second North of Falcon meeting where we'll meet again with our co-managers and further refine the fishery planning models. We'll meet with you again on April 6th to discuss the preferred fishery options for 2022 uh, before the final PFMC meeting. And again, the meeting schedule and links and everything can be found in, in their entirety at the link at the bottom of this slide. Um, so the Pacific Fishery Management Council uh, at its meetings earlier this month set ocean alternatives for this year. Uh, and they are laid out here for both Chinook and Coho. I won't read every number, but you will notice that Coho stocks um, are up considerably from last year, leaving our low option this year uh, still with an intact fishery. So that's great news. And here is just a breakdown of marine area ocean quotas from 2003 to 2021. The black dots and the black lines represent non-treaty quotas, and the gray dots and gray lines represent treaty quotas um, with Chinook on the left and Coho on the right. Um, the take home here is that state and tribal fisheries uh, both take fish in the ocean, and we do need to account for these when determining terminal run fisheries. Um, the next several slides are, again, a bit of a review from our forecast meeting earlier this month. So uh, here we have Shahela Spring Chinook, Fall Chinook, and Coho trends from 2010 to 2022. The terminal run size is depicted with gray dots and gray lines, and escapement and black dots and black lines. Um, the escapement goals are shown in green, uh, the horizontal dashed green line, and green numbers. So this year's forecast is shown in blue. Um, so you'll note that the forecast for spring Chinook is below the conservation goal, uh, but we are forecasting a really large increase in the number of Chehalis coho. And this year's forecast for spring Chinook is 1,323 fish. Um, we have 12,810 natural fish and 2,147 hatchery fish for fall Chinook. And for coho, we have 1,007 107,442 natural fish and 43,552 hatchery fish. Um, and so now here's our recent Grace Harbor um, pump tulips trends. Uh, these figures are similar to the ones that we saw above. So the run size is again depicted with gray dots and gray lines um, and escapement levels in black dots and black lines. The dashed green line and green numbers show the escapement goals, and the year's forecast again is in blue. Um, you'll note that this year some tulips coho stock is still coming in below escapement. Um, and continuing along, this year's forecast for hump tulips fall chinook is 5,099 natural origin fish and 6,484 hatchery fish. Uh, for hump tulips coho, we have 4,392 natural fish, 29,310 hatchery fish. Uh, and for Grace Harbor chum, the forecast is for 32,720 natural origin fish, 1,879 hatchery fish. Um, again, here are recent trends, uh, this time for 
Quinault and Queets coho runs um, from the years 2010 to 2022. Uh, again, this year's forecast is represented by the blue dots. And our uh, escapement goal for Queets coho is a range, but you can see that we are predicting a much increased run size for the Queets River this year. So our 2022 forecast for Quinault River are 19,429 natural origin fish, 34,705 hatchery fish. And for Queets, it's 18,160 natural fish and 22,214 hatchery fish. And so now that we, we have the numbers down, this is just a review of our 2022 management objectives uh, for fishery planning this year. Um, the total adult return of Chehalis Spring Chinook is forecasted below the spawning escapement objective. So no directed fishery opportunities for them are gonna be considered in this year's planning. Um, there are a number of Gray's Harbor salmon stocks that have been meeting management thresholds in recent years and are forecasted to return in numbers above those levels this year. So these include Hump Tulip Chinook, Chehalis Chinook, and Gray's Harbor Chum Stock. Um, but we do have two stocks that have not met management objectives in three out of five years. And these include Hump Tulip's Coho and Chehalis Coho. Um, the adaptive management section of the Grace Harbor Salmon Management Policy uh, provides guidance to us when Grace Harbor salmon stocks have fallen below these thresholds. Um, and it states, if the number of natural origin spawners was less than the goal in three out of five years, beginning in 2009, uh, the department shall implement the following measures. The predicted fishery impact for that stock in WDFW managed fisheries in the Grace Harbor Basin will not exceed 5% of the adult return to Grace Harbor. Um, so the total adult return of hump tulips coho are forecasted below levels needed to meet spawning escapement. Um, and so we'll plan to achieve uh, spawner objectives uh, with commission guidance for the 22 fishery planning. However, forecasted return of coho to Chehalis Basin is over three times the spawning escapement objective. So similar to Hump Tulip's coho, the adaptive management provisions of policy 3621 would provide guidance such that the impact of WDFW managed fisheries in Grace Harbor would not exceed a 5% impact on Chehalis coho. Um, so to follow along on this topic, I'm gonna hand the mic now over to Mike Sharp to continue this discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Marlene, and, and thank you for kind of providing some of the sideboards uh, and limitations for this fall. Um, the policy is a, a guiding document. Uh, the commission recognized that adaptive management is essential to achieving its purpose. The policy recognizes that fishery management can't be static. It must evolve through time and provide pathways to do so. Development evaluation and implementation of new information into our fisheries management structures is critical to the success of the overarching objective of the policy, which is conservation and within the constraints of conservation, enhance fisheries and provide stability to the fishing industry. This simply can be stated as sustainable fishery management practices. Now with kind of the table set, there's some exciting uh, news uh, that came out of this year's budget package that we would like to share, uh, something we've been working on for a number of years. The regional staff has diligently been working on expanding the fishery monitoring activities in the Grace Harbor Basin, and we're successful in acquiring funding necessary to implement a baseline marine area and freshwater recreational monitoring program in the basin this fall. This is a big jump forward for Grace Harbor Salmon Management, it enables fishery managers to collect in-season data necessary to adaptively manage our fisheries. Combined with our robust commercial fishery monitoring, as well as data sharing with the tribal co-managers, these data sources will be instrumental into the development of additional fishery tools and models to help achieve the intent of the commission guidance. So uh, with all of that said, if we can move to the next slide. 
Um, the reason we are here today is to listen to uh, the public and hearing what you guys have as suggestions as we move forward with fishery management planning this year and uh, to share some of the fishing scenarios that we've looked at uh, as means to which possibly uh, within the guidance of our commission um, move forward with this fall. So the first one, the NALF, another acronym that we all love. Uh, we love them so much. Uh, new abundance last year's fisheries. So basically we, we put together a model that took this year's forecasts and how it looked towards last year's fishing package. And then uh, we took a stab at uh, three other models that potentially could uh, provide opportunity this fall. Um, but again, um, we, we need to listen to the public and, and hear what uh, options that you might think we should look at and then craft, further craft these scenarios and then um, make sure that we have commission guidance uh, as to move forward. So the next slide, please. This is a, a slide that just compares the options or scenarios that we looked at this year. Uh, first column there that's labeled 2021 is last year's fisheries. Um, and, and I'll start by saying North Bay and hump tulips in all the uh, model scenarios, A, B, and C are the same. So I don't have to get into too much detail there, but I uh, just wanted to point that out quickly. So model A was kind of a look at uh, something a little more in the traditional uh, package and season that we had prior to uh, 2015 when our cobalt stocks were kind of crashing. Um, so I, I crafted that fishery um, first off by uh, moving the North Bay closure back to September 15th which is more the traditional uh, date, and then opening East Bay uh, on September 16th. So uh, we, we don't have a, a time period without fishing out in the bay. And then I changed and looked at what does it look like to have a two fish limit. Um, I, and I'll also say that I didn't propose or look at any Chinook directed fishery uh, in the Chehalis side this year. Uh, there are about 1500 fish available. Uh, however, in these three models that I put together, the most restrictive model C uh, still um, showed a 300 uh, non harvest mortality rate on Chinook. So if we looked at any Chinook directed fishery, our seasons would, would be really short. So I figured that might not be a good option. So as we move forward um, in, in the hump tulips, I did make a slight adjustment in that there are a few more wild fish available in the forecast. So in the September time period, last year it was marked selective for Chinook. Uh, I looked at a scenario where it was not mark selective. So it's a two fish bag with releasing wild coho. And then in October, I increased the bag limit to two fish of which only one may be a Chinook. And um, I did move that part of the season to mark selective for Chinook and coho. But because we have additional hatchery fish available, I, I thought let's look at a two fish bag through October. And then the December, uh, November, December time period was the same as last year. One fish bag release Chinook and wild coho. So on the uh, lower Chehalis main stem, I moved the uh, cutoff line back up to Fuller Bridge, which is the traditional uh, spot there. Um, opened the fishery September 16th. And yes, the jack fishery is still in place the August 1st through basically the end of the year, however, or the end of the season. Um, but Chinook release began September 16th. So no Chinook jacks after September 16th, but uh, coho jacks are allowed through the end of December. So uh, that was a two fish bag release Chinook. And then upstream of Fuller, and then all of the tributaries, uh, the traditional October 1st, through December 31st, two fish bag, no Chinook. Um, I wasn't 
willing to go into January, which was historically the uh, end of the season for um, Coho, but uh, I'm looking at going through December 31st on, on that model. Model B is very, it's basically the same as model A. Uh, the only difference is uh, we looked at trying to reduce some of our, our Coho impacts. So uh, what did it look like to go to a one fish bag beginning November 1st? So model B is a two fish, model B is a modified A, except November and December, we went to a one fish bag. And then model C was just to look at what does it, what do the numbers look like if we just go to a one fish bag? So model C is a model A, but a one fish bag. So what does that look like in terms of numbers? Next slide, please. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna go through all of these numbers, but last year's fishery, this year's forecast, modeled at 4.96% uh, for Chehalis wild coho. Um, the numbers are fairly self-explanatory. You have two fish bag, not marked selected, we're gonna catch a bunch of, bunch of coho. Uh, the thing to point out here is that the, the wild ink, uh, harvest rates vary and uh, options A, B, and C cannot go forward without some approval from the commission. Uh, I've thrown up Hump Tulips Chinook here just to show the adjustments and, and how those slight adjustments affected numbers. Uh, losing that one week in the North Bay, uh, lost a few potential Chinook harvest there, but we gained a whole lot more coho by uh, going to that one week or, or two weeks earlier in um, East Bay. And also removing the mark selective in September added a few more Chinook to the uh, harvest um, in the freshwater. And I threw chum in here just to show that these options uh, also have an effect on the chum harvest and that moving away from a uh, minimizing ourselves to 5% would increase chum harvest too. Uh, I really didn't cover a lot of the, uh, well, let me just restate that and say I didn't cover uh, commercial um, schedule at this point in time because it, it, it is going to be one that uh, we need to work diligently with our co-managers. But uh, what I did was look back at historical um, seasons when we had a more abundant coho and um, not many chum available and looked at just adjusting some of the days to an earlier time period and then looked at uh, some tangle net options to reduce our Chinook impacts. So uh, basically what I modeled was a, I think a one, one day in the second week in October, or maybe it was the first week in October, tangle net, one day, the second week in October, tangle net, three days, the third week in October, tangle net, and then three days, the fourth week in October, non-tanglement. Certainly we're going to have to understand that um, developing these schedules will be in concert with the Quinault tribe and we have yet to exchange preliminary um, models yet because we needed to get through this meeting first. So, um, and again, I will say some of these options that we put in here were from um, comments and suggestions that we've already received from the public. So with that said, I am at the end of my presentation and I think we're at a point where we can open up for public uh, comment and suggestions. And I think we go to the next slide. And it looks like we have a hand up, Marlene, are you ready for me to call on? Some people. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it looks like our first hand is from caller ending in one two six. I have allowed you to unmute. Mike, when you laid out those numbers for the Chehalis, um, you were just saying one fish, two fish bag limits. 
Um, is that Mark Select or non-Mark Select? I don't think I heard you say anything about that. Good point. <clears throat> All, everything I did this year right now is a non-selective. So it's a non-selective fisher. Non, it's not selective. So it's it's what you know, first couple of fish you get, except for these chinook. So not mark selective. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Patrick. And it looks like our next hand is from Hamill. I have unmuted you. Oh, you got me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, uh, the Lake Coho, you got them in December. I understand splitting the baby bit, but that natural stock for the Lake Coho has been so traumatized by, to be honest, more by tribal netting after steelhead. So I'm not sure that's a fishery it's good to pursue. When you finally get an up cycle on a, on a stock that's been tromped into the ground, you probably should take it as a binny for the fish and pass. Other than that, um, the policy is meant to be flexible. Uh, if you, I think if you were to run the policy rigid this year, the outcry would be just something beautiful at the next commission meeting. It would be one for the ages, I guarantee. The other side of the coin is because you do have something on the upside and you got, and the way history says it, we make escapement on the upside to run and we miss it when it peaks and heads down the other side. We're always trailing one way and we get ahead of it the other. And there is not much the managers can do about that. So I believe your numbers got to be, eh, you're always wrong. <laughs> you can't be right. But you look on the positive side of where you're reaching. The policy was meant to be flexible, but it isn't meant to be abused. So out of the options you've got, I would go with the C because that puts the rec benefit across the board, everybody equal up top to bottom, and you're not running away saying, Yahoo, the gold mine's here, we're gonna rape the sucker. That is not the way to do it. So I think that's all okay if the, uh, number C. I, without looking at the model and stuff, uh, I don't know about the commercial proposals, okay? I will say this, guys, and don't take this personally, but the email with this stuff come into my computer at 348. Okay, so anybody, if you aren't retired or picking it up on your phone, you had no idea what was going out there or the ability to do any research to have a conversation with you, okay? That's that's just, I realize you probably had a reason it didn't show up because I know you well enough that you don't like the burn sensation, but you know, that, that wasn't good, okay? And also you didn't send a reminder out in a timely manner to the public that the thing was coming down. Now I signed up a long time ago and I loosely keep track of it, but most people don't, okay? So a simple two day in advance notice and with the, with the other things. And also the, the model comes in handy, but the way it came out, it came out okay. So I'll hop off the stump, but I don't feel comfortable at all with December. Okay, that, I just don't feel comfortable with that. I know them sats of stocks, okay? And that's not a good place to be. As for the rest of it, we should do the minimum to achieve equity. And that's the far as we go to push the policy guidelines past the boundaries they were set at. Okay, all oh, bye. Thank you for your comments. Thanks. Yep, all done. Thank you. And our next caller is Travis. Travis, I have allowed you to unmute can you hear me yep we can hear you we can hear you thank you guys for your time um i kind of disagree with the last caller as we see a majority of our hatchery coho in the shahala system coming in in the end of november into december now i understand the the idea of trying to protect the native stock of coho in december 
So that's why I have to agree with either option B or C. I have no problems having a one fish limit in the month of December, um, as long as we get to fish the month of December, because the last two years, we have been shut out of that fishery due to protection of wild steelhead. And I personally, and I fish the Chehalis a lot, have never encountered a steelhead in the month of December fishing for coho salmon. I've never done it. And I'm sure there's people that have, but I have never done it. And I know several people that are guides that have never done it. And so all I'm asking is if we're gonna put this out there that to get our excitement up, that we might get to fish in December this year, if we can know ahead of time, if you're gonna put it out there and say, we're gonna to get to fish through the month of December for coho, we don't wanna find out later in the fall that that's a big letdown because we're gonna lose it again to the steelhead. It's kind of a catch 22. We're always talking about maximizing opportunities for the fishermen, but yet in the situation we've had the last couple of years, our opportunities have not only, we've lost the opportunities for steelhead, understandable, but in that time, we've also lost our coho opportunities, which is where we're fishing. And in turn, we've turned around and had overpopulation, overcrowding of other rivers. We've got people driving from long distances away to go down and fish the cowlets because it's the only place that's open in the wintertime. And to the point where I won't even take my boat out because it's absolutely ridiculous down there on the weekends when the average working guy has to fish. Um, so, but I do appreciate you guys taking the comments and listening to what we said in our first meeting about trying to have a season in December or at least some sort of opportunity for that. So I appreciate that. And uh, I've also sent an email and some more comments in private to you guys and you can respond to those if you, if you care to or not. But I think that's about all I got to say. I'm just, I really would love to see some sort of fishery in December for those late timed hatchery fish that we see a lot of because those are our larger fish and we do catch a lot less unmarked fish in, during that time frame than we do in the early season in October. I'd be willing to give up a couple of weeks in October to be able to fish a couple of weeks in December for a more quality fish. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Hey, Marlene, before the next caller, we've had a couple of requests for you to go back to the um, slide that has the options so that people can kind of refer to that while they're asking questions. Sure thing. Thank you. And our next hand up is Garrett. Garrett, I have allowed you to unmute. I see you're unmuted, Garrett, but we can't hear you if you're saying anything. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you. All right. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say, um, you know, I remember fishing these runs with an amount of fish like this back in 13, 14. Um, if, uh, I mean, if we're considering going to the commission and asking to get by this 5% cap rate for this size of run. Um, I mean, I really support option B or C, um, still gives recreational fishermen a really good chance to harvest some fish. Um, and maybe, I mean, we just, we just need to really watch it next time we have some low runs that we really need to, to cap our impact. So we don't end up back in this position if at all possible. Um, and I would like to propose that, I mean, if we're worried about uh, native fish in December, I mean, even if it's one fish bag, why don't we just go mark select in December? Um, if that'll cut some impacts on our wild fish and allow us to stay on the river longer. Um, and that's all I got for now, thanks. Thank you, Gary. And our next and is Patrick. Patrick, I have allowed you to unmute. I um, forgot to give my opinion. I guess if I had to agree with one, it'd be option C. However, I highly disagree given the bay fishery a two-week head start being September 16th. Um, 
duly partly because one they're going to be catching mostly wild fish two they have water conditions that are advantageous to them catching a lot so with that being said they're going to chew up a lot of impacts before us river guys get in there um so if and when we come to an under forecast the river in river fishery is the one who's going to take take it on getting cutbacks or shut down early if we think about the access from fuller down you have about five major launch access points whereas fuller up during that time of year you have really one or two that's fuller bridge and porter so the amount of fish those guys are handling versus the amount of fish fuller up is handling there's a huge difference there so i don't see why we can't just have a fair start for for the bay and in river uh, i i fair is fair it just feels a little discriminatory if we uh give them a two-week jump duly noted and we do model the differences between fuller bridge down and fuller bridge up thanks patrick our next hand is from melanie melanie i've allowed you to unmute hey thank you for letting me speak today thanks for being there and i guess if we're giving votes i'm going to vote for model b hey um can i before you go any further these were just things we put together so if you guys have good ideas we would love to hear those too. well oh we're i'm, I'm glad stuck with these options I, I i appreciate that and i'm glad to hear that so now that i see my options and i see it on my email I'll make sure that when Bob is more alert, he will look and tell me if he thought that my model pick was the best. But I know he's going to make more comments about being able to fish out in certain areas that I don't really know what your definition of what's 22 North and 22 East. You know, I mean, he wasn't happy last year about how we couldn't fish in front of um, um, Hoquiam as early as we had the year before mm -hmm. and we, and, we and that this year yeah and and i think that you're trying to cover that in one of those but i i wasn't really sure but actually all three I, i'm glad i'm even better to hear that thank you very much i just you know um um i'm glad that i was able to comment and you're reaching out and um um, on another note, I'll be really glad when the meetings are back in person again. Um, I'm hoping that will be a real case because getting on my work computer. Um, <laughs> we won't say anything. Well, it's okay. I work for the government, so it should be okay, you know. But um, um, I, I, I'm hoping to join them again, and I'll make sure that Bob is more. Um, um, aware so he can give me his um, notification. But um, yeah, if I would have seen something a couple of days ago, I would have been a little happier, but I did notice it today. I had my own power outage problems. So, um, but um, yeah, that that's our that was our more issue than not than being able to fish in front of Hoquiam and we were forced to be up the river. Oh, oh, and then the next comment, and, and what's gonna happen to the launch? Uh, I don't know if we have anybody on that can address that. Is that the uh, the um, the one that was kind of launch? taken out in the flood? Yeah, <laughs> I heard that there's not much of that left. It's the river decided not to make that bend there by the, uh, well, the, the mill. The launch seems to be there, but the parking lot does not look stable any longer. And I just wonder what happened down river. Like, you know, where did all of the stuff go? And is, did it go straight down or did it go down river? So. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anybody on uh, WDFW staff that can address that. I would sure hope that we address that this summer. Yeah, I figure I'll be in touch with your office when you guys are opening up and um, back to, um, we can come in and say hi. <laughs> I think that started yesterday. Yeah, today. yeah, today, today's Monday, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess it is. Yeah, I if, if I have it. the time, I may stop in tomorrow on the way back from Eclamptic. But that's all that I got. Okay. Thanks again. Thank, Thank you, Melanie. You.
Thank you. And our next hand is Bob Kratzer. Bob, I have allowed you to unmute. Okay, thanks. Hey, Mike, um, the closure that's happened in the Shahela system the last couple of years in December, is that geared more, is it been more of a steelhead issue than a wild coho issue? Or has it kind of been both? It's steelhead. So um, if we have a, I mean, if you guys continue to model this, have we had talks with the steelhead side? I mean, I just got off the coastal steelhead ad hoc group before coming over here. So I know James is on here. Um, is this going to be a continual thing to where we're going to model a fishery going into December, telling salmon fishermen that you have these models they're picking, and then each year we're going to have this emergency closure because of steelhead. And so if we're going to continue to do that, why, why do we continue to give fishermen the hope that they're going to be able to fish in December if we continue to tell them, oh, no, we can't because of wild steelhead? So, I, and I'm not telling you which way to go. I'm just saying there should be a conversation between the two sides that says, hey, look, we have these issues with these wild steelhead that right now are really trying to protect. So if that's the case, great. But let's not give them hope to the fishermen. Who do, everybody is mad about emergency closures. If you told everybody right now that there would be no fishery in December, here's your options. You might hear a couple of words about that but they would pick an option. Right now they're picking an option that says, oh, we're gonna get the fish through December. And then in December, late November, we're gonna, oh, no, nope, sorry. That's not true. We're gonna close you because of wild steelhead. So we've got to fix that issue. I don't personally fish down there. However, I'm involved in this steelhead issue and it will be something that I'll be able to bring up on the steelhead ad hoc group that you know we need to look at that. Because I do know that it's pretty minimal numbers like even the potential of catching a wild steel then is pretty slim. So I don't see why we would close it, but it is a discussion we have to have. So just thought I would bring that up because I know that as involved as I am, I get a gazillion calls about what I can help do to solve this issue. And it seems like that issue needs to be solved right here in this meeting, not in the end of November. So Thanks. Good Mike, maybe I'll jump in on this one. So, yeah, yeah, so good, James. I like hearing you say. Yeah, Bob, and I'll just say Mike doesn't need me to jump in on this, just so folks know, because uh, we're lucky Mike leads the forecasting work for both steelhead and salmon in the basin. So right. he wrestles with this problem every year, along with the team focus in Grace Harbor. Um, so I think there's a mismatch that you're pretty familiar with, Bob, and maybe others are that the forecast for steelhead isn't really available until, you know, kind of earliest is the fall. So we're in the middle of salmon season. Uh, Mike's monitoring those fisheries with his team while producing forecasts for steelhead. So um, there's nothing going on here around these fishery options that Mike has in front of him um, that he thinks he can't put together, uh, you know, in the absence of steelhead fishery information. So there, it's just a timing issue all that said, and I think this is probably what's on Mike's mind is he's been working really hard and, you know, I've been trying to help and others on the team uh, get a little bit more creative during that December, December time period when we know there's folks that want to interact with coho uh, and limit impact on steelhead in the Chehalis. So um, encounters on steelhead are low. Um, you know, I think everybody can be honest about that in December, but we do have encounters with steelhead. So how can we you know, uh, take part in coho fisheries that are important while protecting steelhead is a question we, we've been asking for the last three years. So we're going to keep digging into it. We've got monitoring money that we didn't have before that we hope will help that, but we can't make any promises about steelhead in December right now. Um, we just can't. So thanks for bringing so, it up. Though. No, but just a suggestion. I think what I hear a lot is, so if, okay, we know that's an issue, right? So the Chehalis hasn't met its escapement on steelhead for the last five or six years. So we're, we're probably fairly confident, I would say, and the department, would, I would think, would say that there's a really good chance that coming this next year, we're probably not going to forecast a run of steelhead that would meet our escapement 
that we would feel confident to say, hey, we're going to have a steelhead season again and we're going to do great. So my guess is that we're not really going to do that. So uh, an emergency opener is way more welcome than emergency closure. So if you're unsure about how the steelhead season is going to go and you know there's a problem there, why would you not close it at the end of November? Don't give anybody the hope that they get to fish. And then when you get your steelhead numbers in, go, oh, it looks like we can carve out this piece and have this. We're going to open up the Shayla's for two more weeks, guys. And everybody is going to jump for joy and love life and everything's good. When you close it in December, when you promise them a December fishery, then it's all bad. People are pissed and so forth. So just a thought process. I know there's a lot going on there. Just thought it'd be something that we should look at. Yeah. Hey, Mike, if you don't mind, I'll say one more thing there. Um, I think Bob's bringing up a really good point for callers. I see there's like 47 people on um, listening. And when you're looking at what's on the screen now and you're sharing with the team here about your preferred option, it may not take a fish biologist to see that the last five years steelhead have not been doing well. And, you know, if you'd spent the last 20 or 30 years on the river, like Bob, um, you might, uh, feel like you really want to go for those fisheries that you've seen perform really well the last few years. And you can share that with us here. Um, uh, but for us to um, imply that we're going to close in December for steelhead right now, I think would just be unfair because we just don't have that information, but it's really important what Bob's bringing up and, um, and that steelhead run is something we're, we're extremely concerned about. So thanks so much, Bob. And if I may add, we have, Something that we didn't have in the past few years is that we've got monies to put bodies and boots on the ground to have in-season evaluations. Okay, and next caller ends in 425. I have allowed you to unmute. you're on your phone you may need to dial star six. Oh, you're unmuted now okay yes, i'm unmuted can you hear me yep we can hear you okay francis escalila so i'm just a little confused about uh the objective for two wild chinook in these uh proposed models uh a two fish bag in the month of september for hump tulips river with two wild kings, um, I'm not sure how much is left in the model. And we're, we're kind of, as a, I'll, I'll, I'll add, I, I'm a Great Harbor advisor since the inception of, of the committee, um, the advisory group, and we're kind of used to seeing the, the working model uh, at these meetings. So that, that's, that's kind of missing here. So uh, I'm just curious how much more wiggle room there is on wild hump tulips uh, Chinook. Um, there is a statement in the policy that when you have small runs of Chinook, you award about 22% of those to the marine fishery. Uh, and when you have a large run of Chinook, a small run being 110% or less of the escapement goal, you have a large run of Chinook, you award 37% or better of the wild chinook to the bay fishery uh this year's run is 142 percent of the goal trust me on the math um uh so it seems the chair going to the marine area should be somewhere between 22 percent and 37 percent as a guideline it's not fixed it is flexible but the way this thing is modeled out you got 4% going to the marine area. That's a big disparity. Uh, if there's room, you ought to give those guys out there with their one fish bag a shot at a wild Chinook. Participation out there is not that big. It really isn't. And you're going to force those guys to sort through a bunch of fish 
those fish are going to be more susceptible to release mortality than one that's browned up and hardened up in the river. Um, not saying that it's small, but there, there, there's a mortality there. Those, those Chinook are probably hardier than coho. There's, there's a mortality there, and uh, it would be nice not to have to sort. You're giving guys in the river two wild fish. You're giving guys in the bay no wild fish. The disparity is 4% versus 96%. So I would just ask for some flexibility. If there's room in the model, you give the bay fishery, North Bay specifically, I'm saying here, a wild fish, a wild coho, no. uh, a wild chin, a wild chin. no coho. No, no. Okay, uh, I'll move on to another issue. Uh, a lot of talk about December um, and uh, what to do with steelhead, what to do with wild coho, which historically haven't been doing that great, uh, according to Mr. Hamilton, and he's absolutely right. The, the, the wild coho on the late side of the run have not done well compared to historic. And uh, I think most of us know why that's the case. Uh, those fish are disappearing in a steelhead gillnet fishery. Um, at the last meeting, we had a young fellow testify that in December, the hatchery to wild ratio tends to flip. Sometimes half of those fish coming through in December are hatchery fish. So if there's an opportunity to harvest hatchery fish from those skook mitigation fish, it would be great to have access to those. If we're concerned about saving some wilds, we don't want to beat up on those wild coho the first year we get a really good run, why not put a one fish bag mark select when you got a pretty good shot at catching a hatchery skook fish? And then finally, there was a comment earlier by Mr. Gaffney about um, uh, the bay getting a two-week jump on the season. Uh, that, that's when they come through. I mean, the, the, the fish ascend the system, so they're going to hit the bay first. That's when the fish are available to the bay. And uh, despite what uh, misconceptions there are about the bay low holding everybody's fish. Bay effort is considerably less than in river effort. And if you look at historic catches over the last four decades, it's slanted about four to one on average, four taken in river for every one taken in salt water. Uh, just, just a fact. Um, and uh, we have sharing in marine area versus uh, freshwater uh, stipulated in the policy as well. Again, a guideline, but this is a very large coho run and you can actually take the time to look at where that is on the policy, but uh, I'll look at it now. The Halus coho salmon on a large run we shared 55, 45, 55 to the freshwater, 45 to the salt. I'm not sure that we actually have that parsed out where those impacts show up on Chehalis Coho. Uh, I'm looking at freshwater catch versus saltwater catch in the model. Oh, it is in here. This is catch, not impact. But you've got about in option B, 3,200 in the bay to 17,000, almost 18,000. So we're talking six to one there. Option C, it's about 3,200 versus almost 14,000. That's easily four to one plus, okay? So I just, want, I just want to make sure that even though the bay does low hole you guys, because we get first crack because we're the first ones on the water, we do not, by any stretch, take the lion's share of the fish. Okay, just want to make that clear. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, got your uh, got it down. Everything you said in notes. And our next hand up is from Travis. Travis, I've allowed you to unmute. Can you guys hear me again? Yeah, we can hear you. 
I just wanted to add to that. And in, in fact, in one of, in the first meeting, I was one of the ones to point out that our hatchery versus wild fish in December is about 50%. That's from my experience every fall. So looking at your guys' options here, I just would like to add, I would be totally okay with say a model B, but say December 1st for the whole month of December, putting down a one fish limit mark, marked only, like was suggested earlier. You know, I just wanted to throw that out there, but I think I would push that back to December 1st to start that mark selective fishery with a one fish bag, not November 1st, um, just because we still encounter a bunch of unmarked fish in the month of November but it's right around Thanksgiving time is when we really start to see the tide turn on marked versus unmarked fish to where we're catching more marked fish than unmarked. So I just wanted to add that um, since we're kind of throwing stuff out there, but thanks. That's thanks again for your guys' time. Thanks, again, thanks for your guys' time. I, I appreciate you guys taking our calls. So that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you and next call, next hand up looks like it is Mark Myers. I have unmuted you. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, first off, uh, thanks for taking my call. Second off, uh, I appreciate the fact that you guys are working for in-season monitoring. I think that'll provide for a bunch of flexibility on your part to either open or close potentially in, you know, and during the season. So bravo there. Um, third, I think uh, I had a question about the chum in the hump tulips, uh, even from a catch and release. I wasn't sure if there was any information, at least on that for the season. Uh, the chum, it, if I can address that real quick, chum is, it's mark selective for Chinook and coho, but chum is part of the bag limit. So if you keep, if it's a one fish bag and you catch a chum, you can keep it if you want. Okay, thank uh, you. And then I would go with option B. I would like to see you keep again, uh, the information you know through December you know, on some of the fishery, uh, I, I agree that there are, I think, enough hatchery in the system to avoid, you know, too many encounters, you know, with the steelhead, at least in the hump system. Um, I also would like you guys to look at the mortality rate or percent that you guys look at. There's been studies, right, that have come out that are, you know, almost like half of kind of what you guys are currently leveraging and utilizing. And I know there's quite a process probably right to review that and get that changed, but I would like that process to at least start. So are you referring to the uh, release mortality of hook and released fisheries? Yes. Okay. Yes, but, you know, um, I, I just think that should be taken into account. I've fished for 25 years, right, on these systems. Uh, I just don't see the dead fish, right, that, that the current mortality rate would would obviously call for, you know, on the amount of times I'm on the river. So just want that to be taken into account if, if at all possible, please. And thank you again for taking my call. Option B. Thank you. And next we have Keith. Keith, I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. So I just have a couple questions. Thank you guys for taking my call. Um, you know, I grew up in the Grace Harbor area and I, I make my living here as a fishing guide. Um, so obviously I'm very passionate about salmon and steelhead. And my question will regard both species. So I know the Satsup River and the Wainichi River right now has um, these projects that are deemed river restoration projects, which each one of them, you know, ranges, you know, at least a million to I think 1.6 million, something like that a piece. And 
Um, the one on the lower sats up actually failed last season. So that's gonna have to be redone this summer. So my question about that, is there a way we can get the funding from somewhere else besides um, WDFW, maybe FEMA or another organization? That is a lot of money that could help um, the fisheries. Um, and the reason I ask that is because, like I said, I make my living on the rivers and I know that these were not put in for restoration. These were put in to um, prevent erosion. Um, for example, one on the Wainuchi was put in to stop the crossover road bridge um, from being washed away. And the one on uh, the upper sats up and the lower sats up were both put in to um, prevent people's homes from being washed away. So um, that's just my question um, and kind of my thought on that. And, and I was just wondering if you guys had any uh, info. If I could address that real quick. Both of these projects were part of the ASRP uh, project, which is a massive, huge um, habitat restoration plan. Sure. And these dollars weren't WDFW dollars. Uh, and Yes, they were in, in implemented to improve habitat. And part of that is bank stabilization. Um, I just floated through the SATSA basin and uh, those technically didn't fail. Uh, they're still in place. Uh, the piling are still there. They're, they're functioning as they are supposed to, um, debris catching and, and whatnot. So um, okay. if they didn't fail, are they going to be redone um, the one below the sats up, you know, the one on the lower. Oh, setup. that one down there, I'm not familiar with. That one, it did yeah. fail and it will be redone. That that one I can't Summer. address. It's the upper one. So uh, it, it, and, just, and on the Wainuchi, there are the okay. two that I can address. So those were not WDF, WDFW general fund? No, they were not. Okay. Well, my misunderstanding. Thank you, Mike. Sorry, I can't address the one on the lower river. Hey, not that a problem. Hands. Thanks for your time. So did you have any more questions? No, that's fisheries? it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And our next hand up is Melanie. Melanie, I have allowed you to unmute. Yes, this is Melanie's husband, Bob Rayo. <laughs> Hi, Bob. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, you didn't know that I'd be able to comment. I'm glad I am. I have, uh, oh, the only comment I have on looking at these seasons is I'm glad that the state is recognizing the uh, potentially larger run to justify the earlier openings on the river. Uh, you know, we have a slightly larger boat now than we did when we started fishing the Chehalis in our canoe. So we can get further out in bad weather, but it's good to see that the smaller boat fishermen are being thought of in these earlier openings, especially out in area 2.2 east, where uh, people fish out in front of the Hoquiam River all the way up through Aber the Aberdeen area. Uh, we've we only started fishing that in the last few years, and we've seen how important that area is to the local fishermen there. The elderly fishermen that have been fishing it all their lives have that shot. And with the October 1st openings in the past, uh, most of the fish have gone through, depending on the weather patterns coming. And so this, ref this reflects an opportunity that has been lost for the last few years and is more representative of the actual uh, projected forecasts. I know that we lost fish last year because of this. And as a result, we saw the lowest turnout we've seen in a long time. And a lot of people went home without fish where it had been lights out for the, for the tribe who had fished earlier in, the, earlier in late September versus October. So I'm glad to see that that's, that's been addressed this year. Uh, I, I share Melanie's concerns about the Montesano launch uh, I think if if actions aren't going to take aren't taken soon, the loss will probably be harder to mitigate than it is now. We watched 
the house just above the launch being being disassembled by the homeowner before it collapsed into the river. And at that point, it was hanging over the edge. So I was just amazed to see that level of damage once the waters had receded. I'd hate to see a launch like that that's so widely used by the small boat fishermen not be uh, accessible anymore. It would seem that that would also qualify under some kind of flood damage grant that should be looked into because obviously there's going to be costs to mitigate the damage to the bank and the parking lot area. And you can't just let the rest of it go to waste. We had too much money invested in that handicapped access ramp, which is one of the few of its kind around, as well as the launch itself. So that's all I got to say. Uh, I'm glad to be able to participate in this meeting. Uh, once again, I'd like to see these lead meetings in person as well. It's nice to put a face on the people we talk about policy with. So thank you very much. Thank you. And next we have Stephen. I have allowed you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so uh, I apologize because I'm driving right now and I can't really see the models. Um, my question or comment rather is more about December. Um, I'd like to see something modeled to protect the wild fish. Um, and I think that uh, a model that would protect those wild coho that we're worried about going into uh, late winter um, would be just a one and done because I hear this uh, talk about hatchery fish. And I, when I, I do agree with that, but I, I would add that you're only gonna see those hatchery fish for, for the main part of that in the saps of, in the skookum chuck and that really with with guys fishing the Chehalis from you know uh, fuller up they would be hard pressed to find those hatchery fish that are headed back to the skook I've got a lot of experience in that area I would just rather see like a one and done um, approach there um, that way our impacts aren't super high on wild fish and you know, you get guys off the water, but it still allows people to um, fish the main stem of the Chehalis and get their coho and not just sit there and beat up on those wild fish looking uh, for a hatchery fish. So that's pretty much the only comment I have, but it sounds like um, we're going to have, a, I wouldn't say a robust, robust run, but it looks like we're going to have a good one this year. And um, yeah, I really uh, appreciate you guys trying to model uh, fishery that's uh, conducive to taking care of the fish, but also taking care of the fishermen and uh, appreciate your guys' time. Thank you. Hey, <clears throat> sorry, thank you. And next caller is from DP. I have un allowed you to unmute. Hey, how are you guys doing? You can hear me? Yeah, we yes. can hear you. All right, I kind of came in late, so I don't honestly know if this is the um, place to talk about maybe rules or stuff to some of these fisheries. Um, and I ain't attacking the master Bob Kratz are out there for twitching by any means. But on the hump tulips during September with the Kings being in, a lot of people have went to twitching jigs for the Chinook season, which we all know you probably can catch a Chinook here and there with twitching jigs, but it's not as successful as other methods. And more often or not, I'm seeing snagged fish all the time and it's really ruining it for bobber and eggs or spinners or whatever other people are using. And I was just wondering if there's any way to implement maybe a anti twitching rule during the month of September or something like that until actually the coho season opens. have that recommendation or that comment noted. And it looks like that is our last hand. Um, looks like Dale had a question in the chat. However, now I'm not seeing him here. Okay, and I see Hamill has his hand back up. I have unmuted you.
Okay. The, the, you guys got me, I take it. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. The, it's interesting to hear some of the suggestions. Uh, the December one where the gentleman uh, advocated Mark Select, um, that's not a bad compromise. I, I wouldn't let anybody near the river in January. Uh, it's a, there ain't no such thing as a steelhead fishery around here. And all the native December steelhead are long gone with the wild, with the old games program at planting chambers and bogus shield and everything else for the tribe to catch. That's what is agreed to at the courts now. So we ain't getting away from that December thing unless you folks can sit down with the Quinn and get them to go somewhere else with that fishery. Okay, because it's not steelhead, they're after coho. The fishermen know it, I know it, you know, the tribal leaders know it. Nobody wants to talk about it. You might take a shot at it, guys. It'd be something different because uh, the tribe ain't gonna grab a gun and shoot you. I mean, tell them what it is. We all know what it is, okay? And then, but the, uh, uh, the upper basin skook mitigation fish, they're all late returning, okay? And they come November, part of December. And with the steelhead reduction, I tracked the bingham and the skook for everybody. And uh, guys, uh, <laughs> it, 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 there's a lot of fish lost to harvest there with the, when you look at the numbers when they come back, okay? So uh, whether or not, you, you're the numbers crunchers, but I think whoever thought said do Mark select in December is has got it right, um, and I, and I think that's a good compromise. But nothing in January. Those that that's the true late hook nose, and they got nobody's got no business bothering that fish. If it was along a larger river, it'd be ESA and a New York heartbeat. Okay, just happens to be a small stream, small run. Um. Other than that, not being able to look at the model, Mike, I can't go B or C or anything like that. Uh, but I will say this. Uh, you provided information, let us see escapement by tributaries. Okay. When I see a number like 440, and it's for the wish car, the Hokium, I can't remember, and it was like 2600 escapement go up the next to the wish call, it ain't no better. The Wainuchis is bad and the Sats is running about half escapement prior. Um, in other words, everything below Fuller Hill and Tidewater has been failing miserably to perform, okay? And so anything we do should be aimed at providing, like I said, equity in the harvest and not having a model. I'm not gonna comment on your, com your the commercial proposal but I will ask you to send me the models for these proposals tomorrow. Would you please? Um, what chance. I probably will do is um, take into consideration everything we have seen here, take into consideration everything we've received via electronic email and whatever options that were there, and then put together a model. So I may not get it done tomorrow, but- Oh, no, 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 don't get me wrong. When I, I said you said you gave, give it to me tomorrow. <laughs> I'm um, fully yeah, aware yeah, of the, yeah, yeah, no, no, the, I'm not, when I say tomorrow, I understand your workload and got it. We've been through, we've danced before. Okay, yeah, my, my so, goal is to get something out as soon as possible. Okay. Because that's really, truly the only way that folks can get a true, true look at what's going on. You okay? Yep. Uh, it just works that way. And so uh, uh, the commercial side, you know, uh, the policy requires that they get uh, uh, a benefit. As long as we're not by bar bar doing 4-3, if we don't violate that or any other provisions of the policy, including sharing between Bay, River, and whatever, if all we're talking about is taking part of the one-time outlier run that, uh, that if any place flexibility should have applied, this would be it. But it did, like I said, it's not like the starting gun, let's go cream the whole damn place, okay? Because guys that you, most people don't know, when you see a, a river that's supposed to have 2,600 fish for escapement and gets 440, 
when you see the same thing in the Wishka, the same thing in the Wainuchi, I mean, at some point in time, everybody's yelling two fish needs to back up and think because the only reason we've been able to get near this river for the last few, couple, three years is the Nawakam. Now, the upper basin the Nawakam's over for me and it's carrying our butt. And we, so it's not a time to go crazy. Just, it's a, just you know, and, and it's one more thing. I've kind of saved this. Uh, when you and I had the little tat on um, aggregate, I'm fully aware that you managed to the aggregate. Okay. Absolutely. I know it's this and that courts and everything else. Okay. I got no problem with the tribes. Okay. I do have problem with both of you. When the two co-managers can see that pattern and they fail to address it, that's a failure on both of your parts, not just the nation, not just you, both of you. It's a failure. That means our harvest ratio that we're applying on down years is too high for the basin as a whole. That's simply what's going on, okay? And it is both of your responsibilities, not yours, not the nation's, both of you have a responsibility to address that damn issue. There's no excuse for not, okay? Because when you got streams like the Satsup at half of escapement and we're still fishing and the nation is just going on like there's nothing going on, you guys aren't doing the right thing. And I hope I didn't offend anybody, but actually I don't care if I did because it's something you need to address. Okay, so, I'm out. Thankfully we managed to the Chehalis goal and, and genetic evaluation shows that there are a little bit of differences, but fish stray. And, and a basin as big as the Chehalis, there's lots of versatility. Uh, and one, one system could have a catastrophic event that causes it to fail and systems around it will eventually repopulate it. But uh, we, we don't manage uh, to a specific stream. And we don't do that for Chinook, uh, we don't do that for Chinook or Steelhead, so. Um, but we do definitely appreciate your comments, Dave. Thank you. And our next hand is Travis. Travis, I have unmuted you. Hey guys, you can hear me one more time. My, my question is actually more about uh, Spring Chinook and Fall Chinook on the Chehalis main stem. Is there, I, I've just noticed this and I'm kind of new to how that works. Um, <clears throat> It seemed like about 10, maybe 12 years ago, we were allowed to fish for spring Chinook on the Chehalis at like the mouth of the Skookumchuck. Is, if there's no hatchery, is, it, is there laws pertaining to why we can't try to boost the fall and spring Chinook runs on the Chehalis? I don't know this, this I'm asking this question, to maybe create another fishery for us because we have lost other fisheries um, throughout the coastal region. Is, is there a way to maybe add that a hatchery or a broad stock stocking program to that to boost those runs to give us a fall Chinook and a spring Chinook fishery on the Chehalis. I'm just curious. I don't know. I don't know what the rules are with that. So I'm asking. So nobody wants to jump in. So I guess I will. Um, yeah, there hasn't been a spring Chinook uh, hatchery program at all. Um, and, and it was maybe only three or or four or five years ago when we last had a, a spring chinook fishery. Um, why don't we have hatchery programs for chinook on the Chehalis? I mean, there's a small one up in, uh, on the Sats up. Um, really, it's been more of a funding issue and I'm not sure if there's others that can override what I'm saying, but um, funding hasn't been provided to increase those. Um, a hatchery production opportunities. And there really hasn't been a push to do that. The wild population, uh, particularly the fall Chinook has been doing fairly well. Um, and the reason I didn't put a Chinook directed fishery um, in this year is that it draws a lot of attention. And with the fairly minimal 
um, um, surplus that we had available, 1500 or so, would have been eaten up within a couple of weeks, which one then reduce our seasons greatly. But um, certainly, uh, I'm not sure if anybody else agrees with me, but the hatchery production would potentially increase opportunity in the future, but um, there's no law against it. Uh, there's just a lot of funding issues and then working with the co-managers on that. Yeah, and like, I think you did a great job answering that. And I, I appreciate that comment from Travis that there's a lot in that, you know, if we're talking about spring Chinook in the Chehalis Basin, I think you'd want a hatchery program that was consistent with the recovery plan. And you mentioned broodstock programs and with the small population of wild spring Chinook, I think bringing some of them into the hatchery to create a broodstock program, you know, that'd be a, that'd be a challenging goal. So I think it's kind of a longer discussion about um, how a hatchery program on that low abundance of spring Chinook would fit in. So maybe that's one that, that we sort of keep, keep discussing down the road. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, uh, you know, I just, we're, we're always talking about creating opportunities and, and I think that uh, that would give us, you know, even, even the fall fish that are doing good, boost them a little bit, but give us another fishery in the spring, you know, if we got something like that rolling, I think it'd be, it. Um, I know I certainly would appreciate it and enjoy it. Um, and I'd be willing to talk to you guys, you know, outside of, outside of this, this forum here, anytime to talk about it and see if there's things that we can do to try to get the funding to get something like that rolling. I'd be all over it. Thanks, Travis. Thank you. And our next question, our next hand is from Dwayne. Dwayne, I have allowed you to unmute. Hey, uh, thanks for uh, thanks for having the meeting here tonight, guys. It's uh, <clears throat> great for persons to be able to take a look at numbers and options and uh, weigh in. So, a um, couple things. I think I like uh, Model B. I think with the current uh, makeup of our recognized commission, this may be one that they would give a positive nod to, um, exceeding the five percent uh, impacts as previously structured with our um, our three of five and our our models that we've been running for years so I think that one that one gets in there um, it's already in place on the hump tulips I would like to see as formerly mentioned by a few folks if we could put that that uh, mark select fishery in the Chehalis basin on those coho for the month of December I think that's a safeguard that should be addressed and you know to Dave's credit um, and as this kind of ties in with the steelhead component, James and Mike, um, there is concern about, you know, moving forward with any of these models and, and yet only to be shut down December 1 again. Uh, James, I don't have to remind you, obviously, how, how bad of a taste that left in so many persons' mouths based on the, um, the agreed to fisheries and everybody looking forward to that December opportunity for coho only to have it removed based on concerns for steelhead. So I guess a couple of things. Um, it's exciting that legislation passed uh, and monies are available for this year. And as Mike, you mentioned, we'll see boots on the ground and, and uh, in-season monitoring, you know, with hopefully creel sampling and, and a number of our, um, uh, the main stem and the trids to try and grab some numbers as to how much of an impact we're having on some of these fisheries. That's that's exciting stuff because we haven't seen that for years. So, you know, credit to our current legislation and getting that passed through and the amount of money is uh, is fantastic. Um, but that doesn't, doesn't really give you, as James mentioned, that doesn't give you the uh, information you're seeking prior to going in setting these seasons and trying to pay attention to what may happen or where we may land with our steelhead. So, I guess this is kind of a question. I have to assume uh, you guys would look back relying on the terminal area gillnet fisheries to, to kind, kind of gather intel on the percentage of wild steelhead that would be impacted in that Chehalis, in that lower hump tulips in the month of December. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that 
there's a awful, you know, high percentage of encounter on those wild steelhead to give us that huge of a concern. Maybe I'm wrong because obviously I've never seen those numbers or I have no idea. So I don't know if you can go off of historical data and catch percentage and encounters of wild steelhead uh, for the past five plus years when they had con conducted gillnet fisheries. And I know, and everybody knows, as Dave had alluded to, the higher the higher prize in the bag is the is the larger coho. Um, that's no secret. And the encounter rate of even hatchery steelhead on some years is is quite a bit lower. Um, so I would just I would like to think we could get through an entire month of December with a uh, a targeted fishery on hatchery coho in both systems, uh, even if it's a one fish bag December one through thirty one. Uh, knowing that we're not going to have an excessively high encounter rate on uh, on wild steelhead, so that's just kind of a couple of things I wanted to mention to you guys. Yeah, I, I guess I'll say, Dwayne, I really appreciate all your comments there, and I think most of what you said made a lot of sense and and kind of helps us frame up that challenge with both steelhead and salmon, especially during December. Um, the numbers around what percentage of the wild sealhead population enter in December, um, those are numbers we dig in pretty hard in the fall when these forecasts um, come into play. So we do share those and it'd be great to get uh, as many eyes as we can. Um, I would say dealing with this problem now for a couple of years or more, um, Mike Scharf uh, here developed, you know, some new tools to look at, you know, when a large number of coho coming in December, does that actually lower the impact of steelhead? Because as an angler, if you're fishing a pool and there's, you know, a thousand coho and one steelhead, your chances of encountering that steelhead are, are extremely low versus if you got one coho and one steelhead. So Mike's math is getting more and more fine tuned every year. Um, and then we've got the monitoring on top of that. So that closure in December left uh, the state, all the fish managers here with a bad taste in our mouth too. It was, that was a big bummer for everybody. So yeah, just try to do better next year. So thanks for all the feedback. Yeah, you bet. And it looks like that was our last hand. So we'll give a few. reminder here. If you're on the phone, if you want to raise your hand, you can dial star nine. And if you are on the computer or on an app, you may need to find, you may need to click the reactions tab at the bottom of your screen. Is that it for our raised hands there, Leah? Yeah, that looks like that's it. Okay, well, thanks so much. And thanks to everybody out there uh, who came and, and saw and commented. Um, on the screen here, you can see uh, the links if you wanna submit any other North of Falcon related public comments. Um, you can do that electronically on our website. And if you are not currently a member of the Grace Harbor distribution list, but would like to be, uh, you can see the email address to join there too. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again on, on April 6th. So thank you and have a great night.